V.S. Ramachandran is director of the Center for Brain and Cognition at the University of California, San Diego, and an adjunct professor at the Salk Institute. He originally trained as a doctor, and over the years he's pursued two parallel careers, one in human vision and the other in behavioral neurology. He was awarded the prestigious Henry Dale Medal, and he was elected to an honorary life fellowship by the Royal Institution of Great Britain in 2005. He was also elected to a fellowship at All Souls College. And in 2003, he gave the Wreath Lectures on the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, which later became a book uh, called A Brief Tour of Human Consciousness. He's a world-renowned brain researcher, widely known for the ingenuity and elegance of his experiments. And the Oxford biologist Richard Dawkins, uh, who wrote The Selfish Gene, once called Rama the Marco Polo of neuroscience. So, welcome. Uh, one thing to begin with, um, could you explain the VS? Uh, it's Vileonur Subramanian Ramachandran. And your parents' in de de dedications are Vileonur Subramanian and Vileonur Minakshi? Correct, yes. So is Vileonur a family name? How does Vileonur, it work? Vileonur is a family name, but we do have this curious custom in southern India where we flip it around. And Ramachandran is in fact my given name, but I don't know how it happened. It's V.S. Ramachandran and my father is V.M. Subramanian. And I understand uh, it, this happens in other countries too, for example, <laughs> in, in China too, to some extent. All right. Um, you've also written about the, uh, the, the important contribution of India in terms of mathematicians and scientists and so on. Before we get into your own career, could you just give us some sort of sense of, of the background of this? The sure, yeah. I mean, at the risk of sounding a bit j jingoistic, uh, what I would say is that um, you know, people throughout the world, even Indians, settled abroad. When you think of India, you think of curry, and you think of uh, cows, holy cows, and you think of, sometimes you think of yoga, which is a positive thing, uh, or meditation, things of that nature. Uh, but what people overlook is the fact that a great deal of science originally comes from India. Uh, for example, geometry is mainly Greek, so we don't deserve the credit for that. Right. And on the other hand, a great deal of um, arithmetic and number theory comes from India. For example, as everybody knows, the idea of zero comes from India. Not just the symbol zero, and this is a mistake commonly made by uh, people who don't know, but it's not just the symbol, but the notion of zero uh, as a place marker and the use of what we call the uh, uh, place coding, positional coding in, in the number system. So if you have 453, is 4 multiplied by 100, 5 multiplied by 10, and 3 by 1. So at a time when a Roman soldier, if you asked him to, or a Roman king, if you ask him to multiply 25 by 22, you take an entire wall in about half an hour. <laughs> the average Indian peasant could do it in about 10 seconds using the number system. And this then spread from India to the Caliph of Baghdad around the 7th, 8th century AD. From there, it went to Europe. And it's not just Europe. As I said, it's place value plus zero plus the actual numbers, which we call Arabic numbers, but in fact, they came from India. One, two, three, four, the symbols. So you need, you need the combined, the combination of zero and place value and the actual compact system of 10 numbers to get mathematics off the ground. Then it went via the Arabs to the Moors, uh, through the, via the Moors to, uh, sp in the, to Spain, where the, the monks and, and the clergy kept it going. But initially, there was great reluctance to accept it because they said, that, you know, that's why the word cipher comes from. Cipher in Indian means zero, and Arabic means zero. But cipher also means a mysterious code. So they regarded this as an example of oriental treachery, using magic to conceal some information. But eventually, after another 300 years, Fibonacci came along and accepted this. And then it spread throughout Europe, and hence modern mathematics, and hence computers. And one could go on like this. There are many, many, many discoveries which did originate in India. But one thing that did not come from India, and I'll mention that, is the idea of proof. They thought they were too smart, and you don't need to prove things. And that is a uniquely Greek notion. And in fact, not even Greek. Even the Greeks were thought they were too clever for proof. If you remember, Aristotle mm -hmm. made pronouncements and decided you don't need to prove it. And said, well, heavy objects, of course, fall faster. It's common sense. It doesn't need proof. And the idea of proof comes from one man, an Italian guy named Galileo. And it's amazing if you think about it, OK? Thousands of years, anybody could have gone on top of a big tower and <laughs> taken a cannonball and a pea and robbed it. It takes 10 seconds to check this idea, right? Nobody did. It took 3,000 years. 
And then Galileo comes along and he actually does the experiment. That's all he does, right? Sure enough, they fall at the same time, hit the ground at the same time. So the idea that you can actually ask questions about nature, do experiments. So not so much the idea of proof, but the idea of experiments comes from Galileo. The Greeks did have an idea of proof, for example, proving geometric theorems. But the idea of experiments is alien to the human mind. It's now commonplace. We all do it. And we even know about control experiments and so on and so forth. But the basic idea of the experiment is alien to common sense and alien to the human mind. And it got Galileo into a lot of trouble. It got him into a lot of trouble initially, <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. coughs> um, so were you born in India? Yes, I was born in India. But to some extent, I was raised all over the world, especially in Thailand and Bangkok, because my father was a diplomat there. So I shuttled back and forth between Bangkok and Madras. And uh, so I had a very, I was very mixed up. <laughs> so, but your family, uh, I remember when we first met, we talked about this. Your, wasn't your, didn't your grandfather or great-grandfather write the Constitution of India? Or? My grandfather on the maternal side, uh, Sir Alari Krishnaswamy, he in fact wrote the Constitution of India along with Ambedkar. Uh, who, so he's a core architect of the Constitution of India. Yeah, so there's, there is some sort of political and legal background in the family as well? Yeah, but m m most of my family is, in fact, scientific, academic, medical. Uh, he was an anomaly, uh, in a sense. But yes, you know, scholarly, so either law or the professions or science. And your parents? My father was an engineer. And Are they still alive, by the way? No, my father died nearly 25 years ago. Right. My mother's still alive. And uh, he was... Uh, head of uh, industry in the United Nations, ICAFE in, in Thailand. So that's why I said diplomatic service. Right. So I've been to Singapore, Thailand, India, and I'll go back and forth. So I, was, I got very muddled because I spent six months in school in, in England and six months in India, and the syllabus just didn't overlap that much. So <laughs> it was disorienting, but... So this is why you're fluent when you order food in a Thai restaurant. I now understand. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. OK. <laughs> Um, were you, did your parents interest you in science, or was this something that emerged from the, the uncles? It emerged or? from the interaction and with my, from my uncle, and my mother actually got me excited about science. My father was a pragmatic man. He said, get into medicine, because then you're assured of a living, and uh, because you can be a no-good doctor and get away with it, but you can't be a no-good scientist and get away with it, right? uh, given tenure and all that, so that sort of thing. So he said, get into medicine, and then later, if you're, you're mainly interested <laughs> in, in science, you can always shift gears and get into uh, science. Yeah. So, so I, mean, I remember getting a chemistry set when I was growing up. Did you, same? Oh, yeah. yeah no, I was passionate about science from a very early age, you know, from maybe 10 or 11. And I had very good science teachers in, in Bangkok. And that makes a huge difference. And they would give us chemicals, and they'd tell us about experiments, give us chemicals and say, go try this at home. And this would be unheard of today because they're worried about legal This is mi Mrs. Vanit and Mrs. Panachura. My God, you've got a great memory. Yeah, Mrs. Vanit and Mrs. Panachura. But they, but they let you take the chemicals home? They would let us take the chemicals home. Uh -huh. And, and uh, I remember Mrs. Vanit, uh, sorry, Mrs. Panachura <laughs> taking a, a piece of magnesium, magnesium ribbon, and setting it, you know, lighting it so it was burning. And then, of course, it was burning and it was getting oxidized. Uh -huh. But then she would dip it into water and it would continue burning in the water. Magic. Magic, you know. So the great thing is you start with magic, and then you tell people, no, it's not magic. There's a clear explanation for it. The magnesium is actually extracting the oxygen from the water. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what all of science is about. You know, this is equally true in my next phase when I got into visual illusions. Illusions are like magic. They violate common sense. How can this line seem longer than this line when I put a a, a ruler, and I find, in fact, they're exactly the same length, knowing this doesn't help. Right? And there are dozens and dozens of visual illusions where you see these, and however much you know it's an illusion, it doesn't help. And illusions are anomalies. They violate common sense. But then you try to explain it. And the process of trying to explain it, and finally you say, aha, I've got the explanation. That's wonderful. You know, translating magic into science. And, and this is what I think most scientists do, and certainly I do, whether it's um, playing with chemicals, or doing experiments on visual illusions, or doing experiments in neurology where there's something spooky. You know, a patient says, my arm is missing, but I still feel it's that. Or a patient says, my arm doesn't exist, doctor. Here's a person who's completely lucid and intelligent with, with a lesion in the right parietal, says, this arm doesn't belong to me. It belongs to my grandmother. Now, can somebody 
who's perfectly lucid and intelligent, assert that. So there is a thread going through all of this. That's what I'm trying to say, you know, from my childhood chemistry experiments all the way to neurology. When I first, <clears throat> when I first met you, you were actually working in uh, the, the things that we talked about at length in those days uh, was, was your visual illusions, the vision system, visual system, and also the phantom limb work. Um, and I think the reputation you had then, although obviously there's now this enormous body of work so that people listen to what you've been saying and say, well, perhaps if Ram has done it, there's something intriguing going on there. There, there was, there was a, a joke of saying, well, Rama has an N of one. In other words, you know, in, in science, uh, he has one example, number only of one, whereas most science is conducted by people who have vast databases and draw graphs and so on. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a problem uh, in trying to convince credibility. people. Credibility. Well, the answer to that is if you have a track record, people believe you more, A. And B, I mean, the short answer is you start with an N of 1, and then you have to confirm it, I'm doing lots of experiments. But I like to be, be the one who does the N of 1, and then, of course, you need to <coughs> uh, top the I's, cross the T's, do more experiments. But let me give you a couple of analogies. You know, one of my favorite analogies is if I bring a pig into this room, for example, now, and I say, this pig can talk. And you say, really? What do you mean the pig can talk? And I wave my wand, and the pig starts talking. What would be your reaction? You, wouldn't, you would say, my god. You wouldn't say, well, that's just an N of one. Show me another pig. Mm -hmm. okay? And yet, this used to be the reaction of, of many scientists. And forget about pigs. Look at the history of science. Even look at hard science like physics. We just talked about Galileo. Mm -hmm. His two most famous experiments were taking a pea and a cannonball and dropping them. That was an end of one, initially, <laughs> okay? Right? The second experiment was when he looked through a telescope. People think that telescopes, the Galileo invented the telescope. He didn't. It was used by children as a mm -hmm. toy. Mm -hmm. It was invented somewhere in, in Italy. And he's walking around the street fast, and he saw, saw this thing, the cardboard tube with two lenses. And people are mainly using it to look at other people, to spy on other people. And he said, my god, why don't I get this and look at the heavens? And all he did was tilt it 45 degrees and look at the heavens instead of looking at people. I'm simplifying it. He, of course, polished the lenses and to eliminate chromatic aberration, spherical aberration, and all of that. But once he had done that, he looked at the Milky Way. My god, it's thousands and thousands of stars. And then he looks at Jupiter. And he says, my god, here's Jupiter. And there are three dots near that. What, what are they? And nobody's ever seen this before. Imperfections. Imperfections? Yeah. And he said, <laughs> no. They're in fact, then he kept looking. One of them disappeared. Both of them disappeared. And he said, my god, the dots have disappeared. Waited a little bit, and the dots reappeared. And he said, I know what it is. It's moons going around Jupiter. That's why they're being temporarily occluded. So he said, my god, if things can go around Jupiter, then maybe not everything goes around the Earth. So in that N of 1, that one little observation, he dethroned the geocentric view of the universe and replaced it with the heliocentric theory. But there's more to it. He looked at Venus and saw that it went through mm -hmm. phases like the moon. But the point is these very simple observations, just using a cardboard tube, that's the birth of physics. Or Röntgen looking at x-rays. You know, He had a cathode ray tube, switches it on, has an x-ray film, actually not an x-ray film, a regular film, and he finds that the film is in the drawer, but it gets blackened. He said, my god, something must be going through. Then he puts his wife's hand there, wife's hand, <laughs> not his own hand, and he finds that he, he sees the bones in the X-ray film. This is an N of one. He knew nobody would believe him. He put it in the newspapers because he didn't want to go through the refereeing system. He put it in the newspapers. Next day, his wife's hand, including the wedding ring, was all over the newspapers in Europe. The rest is history, got the Nobel Prize. And I can go on and on like that. In neurology, my own field, every major discovery, whether it's Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia, you know, the language disturbances that occur when language areas are damaged, neglect, when you neglect the entire left side of the visual field when the right hemisphere is damaged, enosognosia, denial of paralysis, blind sight, where a person is damaged to the visual cortex, is completely blind, yet can reach out and touch objects in the region where he's blind, and he can't see anything. All of these discoveries, homizerotomy, split brain patients, were based on an N of 1 or N of 2, initially. And in fact, I'll go a step further, not a single discovery has been made by saying, let's analyze all the data from hundreds of patients and see if there is a trend. I'm not saying that never happens. But there's a lesson here. Why is it 30 discoveries have been made with an N of 1 and not a single one by averaging? I'm overstating it a bit, but I think that's roughly true. 
So the short answer is you have to start somewhere, and then obviously you need to confirm it. And if you have a good track record, then people believe you. Why don't you go into a, <clears throat> a little bit more detail about one of those things, how you convert an N of 1. For example, I, I remember turning up and seeing you with a patient whose name I think was Derek, if I'm thinking correctly, who'd had a motorcycle engine uh, accident. Uh, uh, he was missing an arm. But when you touched certain parts of his face with a Q-tip, yes. he had what he reported as being sensations in his hand and his yeah, arm. Yeah, I mean, th that's a good example. And... Uh, we're interested in phantom limbs, and I've always been interested in that. I don't think anybody here who's not interested in phantom limbs. You know, I started, when I was a medical student, I would see patients who are missing an arm and who would say, I can still feel it, you know, reaching out to grab objects or waving goodbye or shaking your hand. I mean, the guy wasn't stupid or deluded. He knew there was no arm, right? It's not a hallucination, but he had a very compelling feeling that the arm was still there. And the question is, how do you go about studying this? This has been known for over 100 years. You know, it goes back to Silas Ware Mitchell, who coined the phrase phantom limb. So I had a patient sitting in my office, blindfolded him, and simply touched him. These were inspired in part by earlier experiments in animals. Um, but it had never been done in a clinical context. So I had this patient, Derek, who was blindfolded. His entire left arm had been amputated about the elbow about 10 years earlier. So I took a Q-tip and you know, touched different parts of his body. And I said, what do you feel? Remember, his left arm was amputated, and he had a vivid left phantom arm. Well, he said, oh, you're touching my face on the right side. What about that? That's my forehead. What about that? That's my chest. What about that? that that's my belly, and it tickles. Okay. So I kept touching him different parts of the body. And then I said, what about that? He said, oh, my god, that feels like you're touching my phantom thumb, my missing phantom thumb. How about that, my phantom index finger? How about that, my phantom pinky? And I took a you know, felt pen and drew the individual digits on his face, the thumb, the index finger, the pinky, and very clearly delineated regions. There's a complete remapping. Now, why does this happen? So I looked at the pen field map, which simply means the entire left side of your body, the skin surface, is mapped onto the right side of the brain. There's a vertical strip called the postcentral gyrus behind the central furrow in the brain. Um, and then this vertical strip has a complete map of the entire left side of the body in your right hemisphere. And the map, by map, I mean every point on the skin surface has a corresponding point on the surface of the brain. And the map is systematic. In fact, it's like a person draped on the surface of the cortex. You may have seen pictures of this. Now, the amazing thing is it is a continuous map, which is what you mean by a map, this topography. But some parts are dislocated. So the hand region of the map is actually right next to the face region. And it's not clear why. In other words, the head, instead of being near the neck, where it should be, is dislocated and it's below the head. So that gave me the clue. And I said, my god, what's going on here is you've amputated the arm. So the sensory region corresponding to the hand in the brain is deprived of sensory input. It's hungry for sensory input. Maybe secretes a chemical, a neurotrophic factor. And then the fibers that are going from the adjacent face region to the face, sorry, face skin, to the face region of the cortex, invade the vacated territory corresponding to the missing hand. So when you touch the face, that message goes not only to the face area, like it should, but invades the territory corresponding to the missing hand, activates the hand area of the brain, so the brain is fooled into thinking you're touching the missing hand. So here's an example of how you can play Sherlock Holmes with these patients. You're going to start with a very, with a magic. You know, why would somebody say, somebody in his right mind say, when you touch his face, you're touching his fingertips? Why would you get a systematic map, right? Now, it's a one N of one, but it was too, almost too good to be true, you say. Well, look, it fits with what we know about the anatomy. But I had him come back three weeks later. OK, and of course, he had cleaned his face. There's nothing there. And I remapped him. And you get the same map. You know, and you map, map with a felt pen. You know, we've taken a photograph. Perfect registration. How could he have memorized this? Unless every day when he got, went home, he did it again, looked in the mirror. And it was all very far-fetched, you see. So I knew this was real at once. But of course, we sent, sent, to, sent the paper to science and it was published, fortunately, even though it was an N of 1. But then we repeated this on dozens of patients. Sure enough, there's some variability, but and other groups have repeated it and since then. So you have an intuition of when an N of 1 is you know, valid and when it's not valid. But has it gone beyond that to where you know that the, um, 
the, the neuroscience part of it has, has yes. been proven out. So this is an example of the black box approach, right? You do something external to the system, so to speak. And then you ask the subject what he's experiencing. And then you come up with a model based on what's known about the brain, right? Preferably constrained by the neuroanatomy. You can come up with a black box model without even knowing anything about the brain. Hmm. But if you know some, something about the brain, then that reduces the problem space, makes it easier to do. So we came up with this theory about what's going on. Then we had a couple of patients. We did MEG, magnetoencephalography, which is a brain imaging technique, which allows you to fairly precisely localize, if I touch the finger, for example, the index finger and the ring finger, different points on the map get excited. So I can map the surface of the skin on the brain without opening the skull. And we did that on these patients. In a normal person, the, if you touch the hand, it goes to the hand area. If you touch the face, it goes to the face area. In these patients, when you go, touch the face, it goes not only to the face area, but has invaded the hand area, and that also lights up. This we published in Nature. It's done experiments done with Floyd Bloom and Tony Yang, who was a medical student working in our lab at that time. So there's a perfect fit between perception, on the one hand, perceptual anomaly, change in perception, and the change in the brain map. And this is the, one of the goals of cognitive neuroscience, try and link phenomenology, psychology, with neuroanatomy and neural connections. And uh, one important thing it showed was, at that time, nearly 15 years ago now, the dogma was that connections, this is one, what I was raised with as a medical student, and generations of students and psychology undergraduates are raised with this Penfield map, and it's assumed this is laid down at birth, and all connections in the brain are laid down in the fetus or in early infancy, and you can't change these connections in the adult brain, by and large. And that's why it's so difficult to treat neurological disorders. When there's damage, that's it. So we had challenged that dogma and said, look, in the adult human brain, here is a change of a basic map, the Penfield map, which every student learns about, over a distance of a centimeter or more in a matter of a couple of weeks. And in fact, later we showed in a matter of a couple of days, this map changes. Okay? Although to get the one centimeter change, it does take a few weeks. So this shows new connections can emerge in the adult brain. And since then, there have been a number of studies showing this. But I believe that was the first demonstration of large scale changes in topography in the adult human brain. Yeah, well, I, th I think one of the most important topics at the moment in neuroscience is the whole concept of plasticity. Um, until fairly recently, it was thought that you were born with a certain complement of neurons, nerve cells, and it was all downhill from here because they just die off. And in fact, we now know that that's not the case. Absolutely. And, and the dogma at that time was connections can't be changed. But in our own campus here, Rusty Gage and Terry Sanofsky, and the work they've done shows this tremendous malleability of connections in, in the adult human brain. Here in Neuron Valley, it's, it's, you know, a lot of the discoveries were made. Um, you said somewhere that you need to be um, obsessively, passionately, almost pathologically curious. Science is a love affair with nature. Is that, that's... Yeah, I think I, I, I still believe in that. I think that um, you, you, it is like many ways like a love affair because of you know, the ups and downs and the obsession <coughs> and, the, uh, and, and the passion. But I, let me qualify that. You have to be obsessive, you have to be passionate, but you have to be playful and detached. This sounds like an oxymoron. You know, how can we get obsessed and yet be playful? But I think this characterizes, I'm not, I'm not talking about me, but many great scientists like Francis Crick, who was a colleague of ours here not long ago. You watch him at work, and proof of the pudding, he discovered DNA, the structure of DNA in the genetic code. He is obsessive. He is passionate. He is having a love affair. But at the same time, there is this playful sense of uh, whimsical uh, playfulness to the whole enterprise. And I think that combination is very potent. You, know, you don't want to get too obsessive and too caught up in it. And I think that it may not work for everybody, by the way. You know, there are different styles of doing science. But certainly, you know, it's something I enjoy, and it's what I do. Otherwise, as you said, if you do that too much, you become, as you put it, in one, one place, um, neurotic. Yes, exactly. Um, I, I, it said you, you had two incompatible ideas in your household, one that you were the chosen one, the very best, and secondly, that you were never good enough for your parents. That seems yeah, to be rather well, a daunting <laughs> environment to grow up in. I know, and I, and I think it's true of many, many groups of people. I had a Jewish postdoc in my lab, Eric Altshula, who's brilliant, and now I'm doing a residency in New York. And he told me that part of that whole culture, uh, and it may be true of American culture in general, but certainly true of his home and part of his culture, 
is that the parents implant in you, and this is true in India of certain groups, the parents implant in you two incompatible ideas. On the one hand, you're perfect. You know, <laughs> you, you are the chosen one. On the other hand, you're never good enough for me. Okay? So if Eric or I were to call our mothers and say, I just got the Nobel Prize, oh. okay, your mother's not going to say, hey, congratulations, that's wonderful. I know what my mother would say. She would say, Did you, I hope you didn't share it with anybody. <laughs> okay. uh, this is a recipe for neurosis. You, know, you become totally, you know, what do you do? You know? But it's a great recipe for making you successful, obsessed, you know, all of those things. Uh, there's a curious, um, I was also reading about some of your childhood heroes. The, why don't you in fact say some of, the, some of the major forces on you as you were growing up, some of the major influences? Well, there's two answers to that. One answer is, of course, your parents have a major influence yeah. on you. But in terms of teachers, I think the most contagious thing in the world is passion. Now, somebody has to be very knowledgeable, obviously, but that's not enough. Uh, I've sometimes, the other day I was strolling in, in, in uh, Golden Gate Park in, in, in uh, San Francisco, and somebody was giving a talk at the Museum of uh, Art there on Kashmiri shawls, which I've never heard of and I don't know anything about other than some people buy them and, you know, <laughs> use them, right? So I said, why would I want to go to a talk on Kashmiri shawls? And I go there and I was absolutely riveted. There's a chap who collects Kashmiri shawls and he was talking about it and and I said, I'm going to leave in 10 minutes. And I couldn't help <laughs> sitting there for an hour and a half to listening to this chap. He was so passionate about it, gave us the whole history of it, how the British came and employed child labor and all sorts of things. And the beauty and elegance, the connoisseurship of Kashmiri shawls. And I went to, I went to India and I said, I have to buy a few of these. <laughs> I think that passion is contagious. And I wish more of our school teachers would be like that. And it um, reminds me of Dead Poets Society. You know, classic mm -hmm. example would be Robin Williams, the role played by Robin Williams in that movie. And so I had very good, the good, I was very really fortunate in having teachers who were very passionate. But in terms of scientific heroes, I was always interested in the history of science. And that's another thing missing from our curricula. Because I think you can learn a lot from the history of science. And I was always enchanted by Victorian science, by Thomas Henry Huxley, Michael Faraday, one of my heroes. Speaking of N of 1, here's a man who takes a <laughs> magnet. You know, he was a bookbinder. He never had any formal education. He takes a magnet, waves it, moves it to and fro in a coil, and says, my god, there's a current produced. If I just put a galvanometer there, there's a current. And he links two areas of science which until then had been completely separate. You know, magnetism on one hand, electricity on the other hand. And it was the birth of electromagnetic induction which is the basis of all motors we use today, practical importance, but also theoretically, it paved the way for Maxwell's field equation. People forget that. So you have the N of 1 experiment. That, in turn, sets the stage for the theoretical views of Maxwell. So he's always been one of my heroes, because he takes very, does very simple experiments. Or take another one, right? People are talking about magnetic fields. And everybody said, well, how do you know there are such fields? You know, maybe like ether, maybe it doesn't exist. So he takes a, a bar magnet, puts it behind a sheet of paper. He sprinkles iron filings on it. I mean, can you think of anything more simple than that? Lo and behold, you see the fields. It's not some concept. Immediately you see these fields, right? Nobody can argue with that. So you're not the end of one. <laughs> and for the first time, anybody had experimentally, of course, I'm simplifying it here, but it's an experimental demonstration of the, of the magnetic field. Two points there. Uh, one, um, there was a time, I mean, Faraday, you remember, it was a demonstrator at the Royal Institution, of which you just became a lifetime fellow, um, with Humphrey Davy, and demonstrated. They performed the Christmas lectures for children, which still go on to this day. So there was a tradition um, in the Victorian times of actually communicating science, because it was important to do that. I think, to, to some extent, that I'd uh, be interested to know from you whether you think that's been lost. And secondly, the history of science, knowing the, the, the background of a subject and so on, perhaps that's difficult, what do you think, when if you're looking at last year's textbook, you're out of date. I mean, it's a very tricky to keep up with the whole business of science. Well, it's all the more important that you have to look at the history of science to keep your sense of perspective. 
And um, yes, last year's textbook is out of date. You have to go to conferences, you have to attend meetings, you have to go to the posters. Often you learn a great deal, but I find myself learning much more from talking to people rather than actually going to the posters. If you pardon my saying, so you go to the Society for Neuroscience, there are 20,000 posters. First of all, you can't take all of it in. Mm. Secondly, you know, you get this weird feeling that people have taken all the abstracts from the previous year and taken all the keywords <laughs> and then jumbled them up in, with a random, you know, in a computer, and then you get all of this year's abstracts. And this takes a lot of the joy and romance out of science. So I often tell students, go there, but mainly talk to people. Go look at all the posters, but then see what direction people are headed, and then go the opposite direction. You know, that's the, I mean, I'm overstating it, but not a bad strategy. An automatic abstract generator. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Now, the other thing is that, speaking of um, popularizing science, in Victorian times, as you said, there's a great tradition of this. All the most eminent scientists, Faraday was a great lecturer. Humphrey Davy was an even more outstanding lecturer. And he discovered about seven or eight of the known elements at the Royal Institution. By the way, I just learned that the test tube was invented at the Royal Institution, which is an interesting factoid. For what? The test well, I mean, but in, in, what, in what circumstances? To do chemical experiments. OK, so. <laughs> OK, yeah. So anyhow. Uh, <laughs> but, but what were they using before that is what I'm trying to what ask. What were using before that? I don't know. <laughs> Terry, do you know? Sorry, I'm not supposed to refer to you. Beakers. Beakers, OK. But anyway, the test tube, the ultimate icon of science. All right. OK, now, Faraday, Thomas Huxley, Okay, all of the and Darwin, of course, wrote a book. Uh, John Murray was keen that it should be intelligible to anybody, not just to specialists. So popular books were being written all the time, and Huxley used to lecture to the common people or to the working men, to use a politically incorrect phrase or out of date phrase, uh, and he would be lecturing to coal, coal miners about um, evolution, about natural selection, all of that. There's a great tradition of this. All of the scientists were doing this. For some reason, it, it became not so fashionable to do in the first 50 years of the 20th century, maybe for 60 or 70 years, until people like Carl Sagan and Bronowski came along. And even then, it was slightly frowned upon. I don't know quite, quite know why, given the great tradition of popularization in the 19th century. But I think it's being revived thanks to people like you and John Brockman. And you know, in the last 15 years, you go into any bookstore, Barnes and Noble, in the table there, which used to be mainly Opera Winfrey and this and that, you see dozens of popular science books. You know, it's overwhelming. You just go and pick up any, and they're extremely well written. And not just the ones by eminent professional scientists, also ones by science writers. Matt Ridley's book, for example, on Francis Crick. Um, that's just one that came to mind. But dozens and dozens of books, which you wouldn't have seen 15 years ago. Mm. Not to mention popular TV program, brains are the flavor of the year. I mean, you've got a dozen programs on the brain. How, how do you pick a problem? Well, you know, people, people often ask me this, and I think the answer is, it depends on, you can ask me personally how I pick problems, but in general, it depends on the scientist's personality. Different people have different strategies. I have this perverse streak, which is to go after anomalies. And by anomalies, I mean very odd phenomena which have been known for a long time, but which have been brushed under the carpet. You can do this a lot in neurology. You can do it when you're studying vision. Phantom limbs are an example. They've been known for 100 years. Um, and you have to be careful, because of course Thomas Kuhn talked about anomalies, how sometimes there's an odd observation, and if it doesn't fit the big picture of science, you brush it under the carpet. Now, people think, my god, scientists are narrow-minded. They brush things under the carpet. But there's a good reason for ignoring anomalies, because most of them are false alarms. You know, telepathy is an anomaly. I hope I'm not offending anybody by saying that. Telepathy. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> uh, spoon bending is an anomaly. Elvis sightings, anomaly. Okay, there are dozens of examples of anomalies. Um, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, right? Because the reason they're anomalies is not only because they don't fit the framework, but because every attempt at verification fails. So how do you know which anomaly to pursue? Okay. X-rays were an anomaly. Here's something hidden inside a desk, right? Opaque desk, but the film is getting blackened because of some mysterious ray. And that was the great insight that Röntgen had when you turn on the cathode ray tube. <coughs> that was an anomaly, right? But he saw the significance. So how do you know which anomalies are fake and which anomalies, you know, you can spend a lifetime pursuing fake anomalies and which ones are genuine? There's no simple answer. You have to have a nose for anomalies. That's one simple answer. 
But the second answer is, if something is regarded as anomalous, like continental drift, bacterial transformation, these are examples of anomalies, simply because they don't fit the big picture, then it's wise to pursue those, because your big picture may be wrong. And it may completely turn your scientific worldview topsy-turvy. On the other hand, if something is an anomaly because it can't be confirmed, right? And the more you study it, the smaller the effect, then you're in serious trouble. And this usually means it's a false alarm, a false anomaly. So general rule of thumb is bacterial transformation was confirmed dozens of times. Continental rift, the evidence was staring at people. You know, the continent, the borders of the continents fit perfectly. The same fossils you see in South America, you see the same dinosaur fossils you see in Brazil, you see in South Africa, right? Sorry, I should say um, West Africa, right? So people said, the pundits at that time said, oh, well, there was a great land bridge across, you know, from, <laughs> from Brazil <laughs> to, to, to Africa, and they all migrated across and died here. <laughs> this is ridiculous. People said this because they couldn't think of a mechanism, mechanism. Of, of how this could possibly happen. And then, of course, people discovered plate tectonics, I knew there was a mechanism, and people said, oh, yes, there's continental drift. That, that explains the distribution of fossils. So OK, com coming back to neurology and brain science, I do the same thing. Look at phenomena such as phantom limb. Look at phenomena like synesthesia, which we've been studying recently, where somebody says, whenever I see five, it's red. Six is blue. Seven is green. Tones, F sharp is green. C sharp is blue. You get your senses muddled up. You have a chapter here called Purple Numbers and Sharp Cheese. Do you want to elaborate on that? OK, so here's an example, which is known since the time of Galton, uh, Darwin's cousin. And he pointed out that certain people see five as red and six as blue and seven as green. And since then, this has been replicated dozens of times. People said, yeah, you know, we've observed this, that some people do this. He also noticed that it runs in families, so there must be a genetic basis to this. Okay? And Galton, as you know, was very interested in the inheritance of various mental traits. He kind of overdid it, but by and large, he had some good ideas. And the phenomenon was reported hundreds of times, not hundreds, dozens of times, but is ignored by mainstream neuroscience and mainstream psychology, because what do you make of it when you say five is red and six is blue? So it's a classic example of an anomaly. Mm -hmm. Now, so what we did was to simply come along and rescue this from oblivion. We said, no, there's something interesting going on here, because it's been repeated too many times. First of all, we found it was common. It's not one in 1,000, one in 10,000, like people claimed, it's one in 200 people. So we found two students and undergraduates at UCSD who saw five as green and seven as blue and two as yellow and so on and so forth. So the question is, how do you know they're not making it up? Maybe it's like spoon bending. Maybe it's like telepathy. So we did a simple clinical experiment which showed that these people were really seeing two as red and five as green, literally, seeing it. Now, how do you show that? Well, you have a computerized display with lots of fives on it, and all the fives are green. And you have one two on it. And of course, the two is red for these people. For you and me, you see a bunch of black squiggles, because they're all black and white. And if I say, find the two embedded among the fives, two? There's no two here. Two? Oh, yes, there's a two. And you take 15, 20 seconds, mm -hmm. 30, 40 seconds. You show it to a synesthete. He says, oh, I see a red two on a green background. And he sees it in a second, much more quickly than you and me. So if he's crazy, how come he's much better at it than all of us? So, OK, so this shows it's an authentic sensory phenomenon because he says, I see it colored red against a background of green. So we did a number of experiments like that. If you lower the contrast of the two, the color falls off and, in fact, disappears at 10%. All of this suggests it's a genuine sensory phenomenon. Then when we did experiments, doing brain imaging experiments with Joff Boynton and Ed Hubbard, and showed, in fact, this cross-wiring in the brain in a specific region called the fusiform gyrus, this cross activation, it turns out that the number center in the brain, put it, to put it very crudely, area which responds to visual graphemes of numbers, is right next to the color area, V4 of the brain. Right? So what's the likelihood that these are almost touching each other and the most common type of synesthesia is a number color synesthesia? We said, this can't be a coincidence. So there's some accidental cross wiring. Why should that be? Well, the clue comes from the fact that it runs in families. Maybe there's a gene which causes pruning between adjacent brain areas as the brain develops. Mm -hmm. So the normal brain <laughs> has excess connections everywhere. And then as you develop, as the brain develops, the excess connections are pruned away, or there are inhibitory transmitters producing lateral inhibition between adjacent modules. 
If the gene that does that, or genes that do that, mutate, and you get a faulty gene, so you don't get the cross-wiring, you're going to get anomalous connections between brain regions. Maybe that's what's happened in synesthesia, and that's why there is this cross-activation. So we did brain imaging experiments. In normal people, if you show a number, only the number area lights up. In a number color synesthete, if you show a number, the number and color area lights up. So far, so good. Then you say, well, what, what's the big deal? Why am I interested in this? Well, one of the things I found out was that synesthesia is eight times more common among artists, poets, and novelists than in the general population. Why would this be? I mean, one possibility is they're all crazy. <laughs> People have said that. But another possibility is that if the same gene is expressed more diffusely throughout the brain, then you're going to get greater opportunity to link le seemingly unrelated brain regions and therefore seemingly unrelated conceptual domains. And that, in turn, is the basis of metaphor. What do art artists, poets, and novelists have in common? The ability to link seemingly unrelated ideas and concepts. And if ideas and concepts are also in different parts of the brain, this greater propensity to cross-activation makes, may, makes you more prone to metaphorical thinking and maybe makes you more prone to artistic. And that, by the way, is why I think that this gene is prevalent in the population. Why do 200, 1 in 200 people have this peculiarity? This would have been eliminated through natural selection hundreds of thousands of years ago. And the reason it persists, it makes certain outliers in the population. There's a hidden agenda, in other words. It makes certain outliers more prone to metaphor analogy, making them more creative, not because it makes some people see fives as reds. That's a byproduct. So anyway, you can go all the way from a gene, if you clone it using a large enough family, clone it, then you go from to brain areas, specific regions in the brain, then you go to psychophysics, doing perceptual experiments, and you go all the way to metaphor and Shakespeare. And you know, That's a wonderful thing. It's not merely enough <laughs> to take an anomaly and then discover what's causing the anomaly. So those are the first two steps. Difficult enough, right? The next step is to show that this has important implications for other aspects of brain functions and to you and me. It's not just some quirk which you're explaining. Is there a gender difference? Is there a more males and females have synesthesia? There is indeed. It's, mu it's more common in women. So there may be a sex-linked basis to it, but it's not being studied carefully. OK. Because your, I mean, if your thesis was that it was being maintained and passed on, because it, there was some sort of selection pressure for it. Yes. Uh, then presumably the theory is that poets and painters and those of an artistic bent are more attractive to mates and therefore leave more offspring. <laughs> well, that has been suggested, of course, by people like Miller. Uh, that is the, the come and see my etchings theory of, yes. of, of uh, artistic talent. And I, I just don't believe that. I mean, I think the problem with Ev Psych, by the way, and I've said this before in print. Ev, by which you mean? By which I mean evolutionary psychology, by which I mean you take every conceivable trait, physical or mental propensity, and you say, why did this evolve? It must have something to do with the way our ancestors were walking around the savanna and, and all the selection pressures. Now, of course, it's partly true that some of our mental traits are because of that. But some of it has this banal ring to it. You say, you know, men like young women because they're more fertile. OK, maybe, you know. Uh, but A, it involves the cultural dimensions of the mind. And I think what's unique about the human brain, especially, is we are the cultured primate. And I'm not saying this to be politically correct. I have absolutely no interest in <coughs> politics. But what I'm saying is what's unique about the human brain is the fact that we have systems of neurons, including the mirror neurons, which enable us to assimilate culture and knowledge through imitation, through emulation, through learning, much more rapidly than any other brain of any other animal. And this is what makes us uniquely human. Okay, So that's one problem with evolutionary psychology. The other more serious problem, I think, is you can come up with any ad hoc theory you want, you want and it becomes very difficult to test. So for example, I could say, people say, well, because we were on the savanna, we, we like this. We like young women, you know, men. And you can, dozens of examples, maybe you can think of some. But you could say, well, men or women like going to the Scripps Aquarium. Why? Why do we like to go to the aquarium? Well, it's because our Devonian ancestors, who are fish up in the Devonian seas, enjoy mating with other fish, obviously, and found them attractive. And maybe there's a residue of this in your brain, and that's why we enjoy going to the aquarium. Now, immediately, that strikes you as ludicrous and absurd. 
Now, why is it any less ludicrous? Why stop at the savannah? I mean, you can go all the way back, back you know. So somehow it doesn't ring true to me. I'm not saying that the whole enterprise of evolutionary psychology is, is, is a waste of time. There are valuable insights com coming from that, but you have to be careful. That's a, that's a different and longer conversation, but, but let me pick you up, pick up the, the one concept there, um, mirror neurons, yeah. which you wrote a, 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 a long paper about when they were first, a few years after they were discovered. Would you like to explain a little bit about mirror neurons, their importance in terms of social cognition? I, yeah, I'll try to do that. First of all, let me say mirror neurons don't explain everything. And there's a mirror neuron mania right now. There is. Around. Yeah, right. there is. But they are extremely interesting. And just very briefly, if you record from individual cells in the brains of primates, say, say a monkey brain, if you go to the front of the brain, the frontal lobes, and record from certain parts of the frontal lobes, you find that a neurons which respond every time the monkey makes a skilled or semi-skilled movement, apparently volitional movement, so the monkey reaches out to grab a peanut, one neuron fires. Now, undoubtedly, this is part of a small network of neurons, it's not that one neuron and peanut <coughs> neuron. So you have to be careful with that. But it fires mainly when the monkey reaches for a peanut. Another monkey, when the monkey pulls a lever, sorry, another neuron will fire when the monkey pulls a lever. Another neuron will fire when the monkey pushes something, right? Another neuron will fire when the monkey puts something in its mouth. Okay, for different actions, there are different neurons firing, right? And this is well known. It goes all the way back to Vernon Mountcastle, and we think of them as motor command neurons, mm -hmm. so that the motor commands are somehow being programmed by networks of neurons, and you can monitor this at the level of single neurons. And this is very exciting. But what's even more exciting is about uh, what, five, ten years ago, Giacomo Rizzolatti, Giacoboni and others in, in uh, Parma in Italy, found that some of these neurons will fight, almost a third of them, will fire not only when the monkey reaches for a peanut. So here's a neuron that fires when the monkey reaches for a peanut. But the neuron will also fire when it watches another monkey reach for the peanut. And this was absolutely amazing when they first discovered it, because it implies that the monkey is doing some sort of computation that allows it to put itself in the other monkey's shoes, OK? Adopt the other monkey's point of view, in other words. Now, you can think of all sorts of heavy and association arguments to explain this, but it doesn't fully explain it. Because the neuron doesn't fire if you simply have a hand moving from its own perspective. It needs to be from the other monkey's perspective, OK? So, this suggests that you have what's been called a monkey see, monkey do neuron, and, or in other words, a mirror neuron. And this is exciting because there's this whole area of research called theory of other minds, being able to adopt another person's point of view. And the great apes can do this to some extent, but humans are especially good at this. You're able to create a virtual reality simulation of what's going on in the other monkey's brain, in your brain. And so this is the basis of interpreting rationally interpreting another monkey's point of view, another person's point of view, what's that person up to, OK? Also, it may be important imitation. So if somebody does something, this is the point I made in my article, then you have to imitate it, not some sort of blind mirroring of that, but adopt that person's point of view in imitating that action. And this, of course, is the basis, believe it or not, of culture, the dawn of culture, because if you are a polar bear, you have to spend thousands, hundreds of thousands of years evolving a fur coat through natural selection. If, you're up, if you suddenly migrate to the North Pole or something, you're a regular bear, and you go to the North Pole, and you want to develop a fur coat. If you're a human, and you watch your mother hunt down and skin a polar bear, it's one trial learning. And I think that's based on mirror neurons. You watch her do this. It's not just mirror neurons, but in conjunction with other parts of the brain. And you do this, and then you learn it, and you put on, you say, I can just kill a polar bear and put the fur coat on and skip thousands of generations. And whether it's hunting or making a, a knife or make, you know, making fire, one of a kind innovation spread horizontally through culture and vertically, almost through Lamarckian, of course, it's not really Lamarckian, but, but inherited through culture very, very rapidly. And this marks the dawn of culture which in turn feeds back on brain evolution. So you have this culture, brain coevolution, and a rapid, explosive development of culture. So that's the importance, I think, of mirror neurons. One of the things my students, Eric Altshuler and uh, Lindsay Oberman and um, my colleague, Jamie Panetta, and I have shown is that in autistic children, there's a deficiency in the mirror neuron system. We don't know this for sure, 
but there's very compelling evidence from EEG and brain imaging studies that this is the case. And if you look at the deficits you see in autism, difficulty in adopting the other person's point of view, difficulty with empathy, difficulty with imitation. And let's talk about empathy for a minute. You can show this in humans. Mirror neurons for pain, for example. Mm -hmm. So in the anterior cingulate, you put an <coughs> electrode in an awake, conscious patient. This has been done in UCLA. You put an electrode in the anterior cingulate. You record from neurons there. Those neurons will fire when you poke the patient with a needle. And this has been known for a while, and they are called pain neurons. People thought there was a hotline from the pain skin pain receptors to a pain center in the brain. We now know there are many layers to experiencing pain, going to the insular cortex, parts of the limbic system, eventually going to the anterior cingulate. Now, that's all known, pain neurons, OK? Now, the amazing thing is what they found was when the person watches another person being poked with a needle, the pain neuron fires almost equal, equally, uh, equally strongly. Now, now, I don't know if it's true of all the neurons, but certainly a subset of neurons do this. Now, this is absolutely amazing if you think about it, because this neuron is an empathy neuron, right? So empathy is no longer some abstract, metaphorical, social phenomenon. You're seeing it at the level of neural circuitry in the anterior cingulate, monitoring it at the level of single neurons, and you're finding an empathy neuron. It's dissolving the barrier between you and another human being, right? So. I like to call it a Dalai Lama neuron, right? because it's the basis of all Eastern mysticism that this illusion that you are a separate person inspecting the world and other people are different, I should be selfish, da 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 da, is all an illusion. Dissolve this barrier and the world will be a better place. So I'm arguing this is not just philosophy, not just metaphor. Your neurons are dissolving the barrier, already dissolving it for you. you know? There's two or three points that I want to pick up there. Um, first of all, the whole notion of being able to walk a mile in someone else's neurons, this whole notion of empathy, um, is, that a, is that a requirement for consciousness? That's getting into a big area, consciousness. Mm. The, reason, the reason I ask that is that you have said before in conversations that, um, that you thought that there was a distinct cutoff between other animals and humans, that humans were unique in that uh, humans had what, what, what we would call qualia, which is the sensation of experiencing these things. Well, listen, I, actually, you, I'm alone in thinking that. Right. Much. I know maybe there are some other colleagues. You're an N of one. Probably an N of one. Right. Um, the idea, the general question, there are several questions when you say, what is consciousness? Right? To, a, to an anesthesiologist or a neurology, he's talking about coma versus consciousness as a scale. And I think that's just the power supply. It's coming from the brain stem and different levels of arousal. And, and being conscious of not conscious. And not, that's not going to get you anywhere looking at those systems and understanding consciousness. In understanding the logic of consciousness, which is what we want to understand. It's like saying you need the Krebs cycle for genetics. Obviously, you do. But that's not the key to understanding genetics. It's the double helical um, structure of the DNA molecule. So let's forget about that. Okay? Now, what are the other questions concerning consciousness? There are two important questions related. One is what we call qualia. Christoph Koch and Francis Crick have championed this view. And uh, philosophers refer to this as qualia. It just means sensations you're conscious of. So I poke you with a needle. It's not just that you say, ow. Okay? There is also an internal subjective experience of consciously being conscious of pain. If I poke somebody else with a needle, I can describe all the pathways, everything that's active, the cascade of chemicals, neural activity coming to the Broca's area, and you say, ow. Right? But I don't experience anything. And you don't, there's no reason for you to postulate that that person is internally experiencing a mental phenomenon called qualia. But wouldn't Skinner you, would say that. wouldn't you, um, given what you just said about mirror neurons? Yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. All right. So what I would argue is when I poke you with a needle, that's a very important question. When I, when I poke myself with a needle, if I look at myself with an autocerebroscope 500 years from now, and I plot <laughs> the diagram and I say, all of these things are going on, but my god, it leaves something out namely the internal subject of experience, right? Or if you're a Martian looking at my brain, and let's say you don't have any qualia. Or forget about Martian. Let's say you're Roger Bingham, and you're born colorblind, and you don't have any color qualia, OK? But you're intelligent, and you learn physics. You know different wavelengths. And you know other creatures like me, like Rama, other human beings, do have the pigments in the eye, and do have color neurons firing away. 
and you show me this diagram and say, look, Rama, I know everything about color vision. All of the pathways are firing away. And I say, Roger, but you're missing something. And that's the crucial subjective experience of green when my green neurons fire, but not red. Subjective experience of red when my red neurons fire, which is ineffable. I cannot communicate it with you, communicate this feeling to you. So that's a qualia problem. The separate problem, which many people have thought of as a separate problem, and I don't think it is. And that is the problem of self, the person who experiences qualia. I can reflect on my qualia. You know, I can say, not only do I experience qualia, but I know that I experience qualia, and I know that I experience qualia. So this is a subjective experience of myself experiencing qualia. There is this peculiar solipsistic quality to it. And Crick and Koch have argued, first, let's solve the qualia problem. And let's get to the self problem later. And I'm saying that's impossible, with all due respect to Francis and Koch, who have made enormous strides in getting people excited about this. I'm, not, I'm saying there is no earlier stage called qualia and subsequent stage self-inspecting the qualia. There's no such thing. The reason is very simple. There's no such thing as free-floating qualia. It's an oxymoron without a self experiencing it. Hmm. Likewise, a self without qualia, without any sensations, memories, subjective sensations, is meaningless. So I claim that these two co-evolved in evolution, and it's intimately linked to language in the, in the Wernicke's area. So let me be more specific. For qualia to have any meaning at all, there has to be meaning. There has to be, so for example, when um, a fruit fly sticks out its proboscis looking at a red apple, okay, so let's assume it has color vision, it probably doesn't, but let's assume it looks at the red apple, it's almost a reflex of it, obviously it's creating a representation of the apple. It has to because it's neural signals. It's not copying the apple. But then, after the representation comes the tongue or the proboscis flicking at the apple. Okay? And then it consumes parts of the apple. This is a caricature, actually, because they probably do it through smell. But let's assume, for the sake of argument, the visual impulse goes in and they stick out the proposals. I claim it has no qualia. Okay? And there's no point in saying it has a raw awareness of the sensation of red or apple. It doesn't. For you, on the other hand, the apple evokes tempting Eve, baking an apple pie, keeping the doctor away, eating. It's got a thousand, in fact, virtually infinite. Or if you're Newton, hey, it's falling. Makes you think of gravity. Maybe that's what holds the solar system in place. Mm -hmm. So the implications are potentially infinite. And this is uniquely human. And this occurs, and I think it's a set of circuits in the brain. Another point I would disagree with is the notion that there are neurons, qualia neurons, or conscious ne neurons. Crick says this playfully, just to be provocative. But some people take it seriously. I don't think there's any such thing. I think that when you're doing reductionism, there's the appropriate level of reductionism and the inappropriate level. So for example, when Crick talked about the reductionist basis of genetics and heredity, and Watson and Crick talked about this, the correct level was, it turned out, they were lucky, was the DNA molecule, the double helical structure and the genetic code. If they had studied quantum mechanics and tried to discover the genetic code at the level of quantum mechanics, they would have failed. So similarly, to understand consciousness and qualia, I don't think you're going to understand it at the level of single neurons. You're going to understand it at the level of circuitry in the brain. But I don't think there's the entire brain. That's important. It's not the activity of the entire brain. It's specific, fairly circumscribed structures. Okay? And what are those structures? So that allows you to home in on the problem. And I think you need to understand the problem of self and the problem of qualia. And they're two sides of a Mobius strip you, or a coin. You cannot understand one without simultaneously understanding other. And this is where people have been led astray, thinking the self is some complicated other problem. Let's, wallet, let's solve qualia first. Eventually, we'll get to the problem of self. And I think you need to solve them, tackle them simultaneously, and you need to map it on, map on the functional logic of consciousness, self, qualia, meaning, right? What do you, how do neurons instantiate meaning? That's the holy, holy grail of neuroscience. And I don't think lower animals even Monkeys do that to the same extent. You may see some rudiments of, of this in great apes. I think it required the emergence of the supramarginal gyrus, which, is, which became the angular gyrus and, the, uh, and another structure in the human brain. Sorry, scratch that. The inferior parietal lobule, which split into angular gyrus and supramarginal gyrus in humans. Right? So that's unique to humans. And an enormous angular gyrus, which is also unique to humans, 
the Wernicke's area, which is unique to humans, and certain other structures, acting conjointly to generate your sense of self, okay, especially the right hemisphere being involved in body image, sense of a self being anchored in your body, the sense of planning for the future, involving partly the anterior cingulate and the frontal lobe, and the self being able to inspect the sensory in information that's coming in. Now, this, this is dangerous territory, because when you say inspect, it makes you think of the homunculus fallacy. There's mm -hmm. a little person watching. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying at some stage in evolution, instead of just sensory representation, you started creating what are called meta-representation, a representation of the representation, unlike the fruit fly, which allows you to manipulate symbols internally in your head. And this is intimately linked to things like meaning. And this is created in the uh, inferior parietal lobule in conjunction with the Wernicke's area. To some extent, it also linked to the sense of agency, which is there in the anterior cingulate. And all of this acting in conjunction, there's the emergence of this dual property of qualia and self which I think is unique to humans. Uh, one argument is that the, the problem stated, what is consciousness, is somewhat analogous to the problem, what is life, as it used to be asked 100 years ago. And the answer was some sort of an elan vital. We don't know exactly what it is, and so on and so forth. And then as you start exploring the consciousness issue, uh, exploring the life issue, and you figure out what proteins do, and you discover DNA, and so on and so forth, nobody says anymore, what is life? They might say, what is meaning? But they don't say, what is life? Because we have a whole panoply of stories from different disciplines that knit together yes. into an answer. Yes. Uh, do you think that, uh, l l let me just go on sure, a little bit sure. here, it, is, is what is consciousness possibly that's, uh, at that stage of problem at, at this point? And I, I say that because in addition to the mirror nor neuron story, there's the work of our colleague John Allman, who's found some neurons that appear uh, in sp specific areas of the brain that and are also apparently diminished or, or damaged in, in autistic syndrome where th these neurons af appear to be very good and in, in, in useful for social cognition, uh, for, for allowing you to make very quick social decisions. Um, so there are, there's lots of areas, lots of parts of brain that we know, on, uh, that we know are beginning to be uh, identified in terms of social cognition. Um, it's possible in the fullness of time that these may all come together and, and answer that question, what is consciousness? So it may be a sure. non-problem. Yeah. Non well, I have three responses to that. Uh, the first <laughs> response is that we shouldn't get too preoccupied with words, as you know, well known. Um, Francis once told me, Francis Crick, there was never a time, and this is a problem because philosophers often raise this. They say, look, you have to get clear about the terminology. I, I got into this problem talking about aesthetics once, you know, neural basis of aesthetics. Some philosopher got up and said, but what do you mean by aesthetics? So, or what do you mean by consciousness? That's a common question. So Francis was giving a talk, and some Oxford philosopher raised his hand and said, before you could even get into the talk, he said, you're talking about consciousness without actually defining it. Give us a precise definition of consciousness, and then we can proceed further. Something along those lines. So Francis said, my dear chap, there was never a time when a bunch of biologists all sat around the table and said, let's first define life before we you know, investigate it further. Let's get the definition clear. What is life? We just went out there and found out what it was. It was a helix. It was a molecule. So we leave definitions and matters of semantic hygiene to the philosophers. Often the definitions follow as you go along. right? It doesn't mean you shouldn't have a rough idea about what you're talking about. Obviously, you must. But you can have what's called a working definition, working hypothesis in the initial stages. OK, that's one answer. Now let's get to consciousness specifically. Um, what is consciousness? Now, is there going to be, is it multiple processes? Like, you don't ask, what is life? Life, it turns out, is a DNA molecule. It's a Krebs cycle. It's mitochondrial enzymes, it's a whole bunch of processes. Protein so folding. Somebody said, yeah, but where is life in all, this, in all this biochemical activity? You say it's a meaningless question. Now, that could happen with consciousness. It could be, as I said, qualia and self. And there are other points, embodiment. I feel like I'm in this body. I don't feel like I'm in Terry's body or, or your body, right? It could be. And then there's a social self. Self undoubtedly involves looking at yourself from another point, person's point of view. So you refer to self-consciousness, being self-conscious. And this may involve mirror neurons. So self as a social construct, right? The unity of self, the notion that it's me who sees this and who sees this paper, piece of paper, 
sees you. I have two halves of the visual field going to two cerebral hemispheres, but I don't see it as two halves. There's a sense of continuity. So there's a sense of unity of self, continuity of time, a sense of a golden thread going through the whole fabric of your experience, going all the way back to early childhood. So all these different aspects of self you might be able to tackle quite separately. For example, the thread may be mostly frontal, right? And other aspects of self may be somewhere else. Body image may be right inferior parietal lobule. So, you know, there are different aspects of self. So just like we don't say what is life. In fact, I like Jim, Jim Watson's quip. He says, uh, there are only molecules. Everything else is sociology. It's going too far, but <laughs> OK. But at least as far as life is concerned, biochemistry is concerned, we don't say what is life. We've got all these different processes. Likewise, for consciousness, it may, it may be that there are different processes. And eventually, you won't ask what is consciousness. The problem will just recede to the background. But the other possibility is there is one grand climactic solution, such as DNA. We just haven't found it. So one has to be agnostic. You know, one has to say, let's look for potential important solutions to this problem of consciousness, not just assume it's bits and pieces and we we'll solve each of these separately. And my answer, potential answer, is look here. Just as chromosomes gave you the solution to the problem of heredity, you wouldn't have solved it looking at proteins, collagen, other parts of the cell. The actions in the chromosome. Mueller showed that, and Morgan showed that, right? And that led people to DNA, X-ray crystallography, eventually to me. So I'm saying, look here if you want to understand consciousness. Look at Wernicke's area, which is unique to humans. Look at inferior parietal lobule. To some extent, look at right inferior parietal lobule, anterior cingulate. It's a fairly small set of structures. And their interactions, that's critical. And how that gives rise to meta-representations of sensory representations gives rise to qualia and a sense of self inspecting qualia. OK, so short answer to your question. I gave you three answers. So the function of the self would be? Well, the function of the self is, is as we said, one is the sense of anchoring. The other is the sense of, you know, you don't want to be a disembodied self. Maybe some people do. But OK, the sense of anchoring, the sense of inspecting yourself to know that you're behaving appropriately. OK, it's multiple functions. Mm -hmm. okay. But there's also there's a subjective sense of self. You know, me inspecting something. People have said that's an illusion. But if it's an illusion, you have to show how does the illusion arise. And maybe it's not an illusion. Maybe there's a scientific solution to the problem of the kind I just outlined. That is, you're creating these matter representations. And how do you use these specific structures I just talked about to create these matter representations and in turn create what we call meaning, right? And we know that Wernicke's aphasics do not understand meaning. Okay, That's what eludes them. So if you want to understand what meaning is, that's a good region of the brain to look at. What is special about the microcircuitry there that generates this? And here we have Crick and Koch to thank, because they said, don't look at the entire brain. There are specific structures involved. I mean, I don't agree with them. There's a separate qualia problem, and then there is the self. I mean, I think they're part of the same problem. But I do agree with them that don't look at the entire brain. There are specific structures. How does the way you think about all this stuff affect the way you believe, uh, you know, the, the way you act, in the sense that uh, if you have a cutoff um, where you're saying that most other animals don't actually experience pain, say, in the way we do. Um, well, <laughs> these raises ethical dilemmas, obviously. Um, my answer is that there is enough of similarity between the pain experienced by a monkey or an ape that I would be hesitant, because of my mirror and neurons firing away or whatever, to cause it pain. But there's not enough reason to exp expect a planarian or a fruit fly to experience not enough similarity that I'd be worried about squashing a fly. Okay? So it becomes, as I said, as, as Francis would have said, when you understand these phenomena more clearly, you know, what qualia is and what self is, then you can begin to make clear, I can answer the question more clearly whether it's okay to hurt uh, a planarian. I'm not okay to hurt a cat or an ape. Certainly not an ape, but would you, would you, is it okay to hurt a cat? Cat lovers would say no. Okay? But I'm saying these are subsidiary issues, because it's like saying uh, abortion. When do you start calling? When is it unethical to kill an embryo? What if it's eight months? Right? What if it's seven months? What if it's six months? So what I'm saying is it, it's similar. I, I, I want to argue that there are critical moments in evolution. And I think something unique did happen maybe 150, 200,000 years ago to the brains of our ape-like ancestors to make you more conscious of your qualia, to contemplate and introspect on your qualia, on your pain, to an extent that is not 
possible in, in even in a monkey. Now, whether that justifies ethically terminating a monkey's life or causing it pain, you can't answer this question now, because it may have some rudimentary semblance to the kind of pain you experience that you don't want to do that. You don't want to cause it pain. Or it may not. Right? For now, it's best to assume that it can. <clears throat> so if a dog yelps, you think that's just a reflex? But look, I mean, humans can yelp without feeling qualia. I mean, to put it very crudely, if I cut your anterior cingulate, right, and then I poke you with a needle, I don't think it was actually known if they yelp, but they certainly withdraw their hand. They, also, they even say, I feel the pain. But I don't feel pain. It's not agonizing. You know, so we have these words which are no longer valid once you get to the kind of analysis I'm talking about. When you get to the nitty gritty, then you can be more specific about how closely its pain, the dog's pain, resembles yours. And then you can make the ethical, ethical decision, is it OK to cause it pain? I would say no, right? But that may be my mirror, mirror neurons talking, because I empathize with my dog. Right? So you, you can't provide a scientific answer to that question yet. So you don't think there are any Bill Clinton dogs, you know, I feel your pain, sort of um, that kind of? I'm sorry, I didn't I feel to. Dogs that feel other dogs' pain. Yeah, I mean, almost surely, you know, other animals have mirror neurons. But people often ask me if monkeys have mirror neurons, and you think mirror neurons are so important for culture, how come monkeys don't have culture to speak of? Well, the short answer is some of them do, but the real answer is we're not saying mirror neurons are sufficient. We're saying something important happened to the circuitry there, but this is where the action is. And that circuitry, when it reached a certain level of sophistication and made connections with certain other regions of the brain, some emergent property evolved. And that's made, that made rapid transmission of culture possible. Okay? And this includes the activity of mirror neurons. They are central, playing a central role. But that doesn't mean that's all you need, because monkeys have it. They don't have culture. Right? I mean, it's like saying wings evolved from Four limbs, and you know, we know that's true. But it's like saying, if that's true, why can't monkeys fly? You know? So it's the same kind of logic there. But some people would argue that other animals do have different kinds of culture. Well, yeah, but it's misusing the word. You know? Right. You, you know, any type of rudimentary imitation and transmission, you could say that's a rudimentary example of human culture, but nothing like the sort of thing you see in, in humans. I mean, it becomes a semantic issue whether you want to call it a qualitative or a quantitative jump. And I think that genuinely emergent properties uh, exist in the human brain, which don't exist in rudimentary forms. In the monkeys, in great apes, you might find some components of this emerging. So obviously, I, I strongly believe in evolution through, the, through natural selection. I don't believe in intelligent design. It is odd that our president is championing the cause of intelligent design, given this, that his own existence is a living negation of this idea. Throw that in. So um, let's go back to your. Uh, 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 now we've dealt with a couple of those issues. Where, given that you describe yourself as, as this child growing up with as being a little bit socially isolated, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, how what happened to end up with this sort of curious combination of um, scientific medical detective, which may, must mean you have a reasonable bedside manner so that you can elicit. Mm -hmm. trust from these various patients, uh, and the showman. I mean, how, how do we get this combination? Well, the social awkwardness as a child, I think, was actually helpful. Because what happens is it makes you withdraw into your private playground of ideas. And I would read lots of books about scientists and biologists. I'll, I was obsessive about collecting seashells and fossils and doing experiments at home. And you know, I, I used to collect seashells on the, on, on the shore. And, dazzled by the amazing variety, as I'm sure every adult is even to this day. And then I said, well, who, what are these? And why is this amazing variety? But then they fall into groups, and you begin to classify them. Then I went to the Madras library, where we had this enormous eight-volume tome about each book folio, each book this big. And they're all hand-colored engravings of seashells, going back to the grand old Victorian times, where one scientist spent a lifetime studying, classifying, and making pictures of seashells. And I would go through this and identify all of these seashells. So that's, you know, often taxonomy and classification is the dawn of science. At that time, they didn't even know about Darwin when they were doing this. But they saw beautiful patterns of, of, of taxonomy. And so, uh, you know, you, you sort of feel, and then you go and read some other book from 1850, 
in 1890, and the library was full of these books, and I felt these were my playmates. Suddenly they, they came alive in my mind. So, so, you know, Reeve, whose book I'm talking about, was my playmate. I was having conversations with him. Uh, Faraday was my playmate. Darwin was my playmate. Huxley was my playmate. So it makes you feel like, not, no longer feel socially awkward and, and bizarre or crazy or clumsy. It makes you feel uh, that you have your own private world. And, and you exchange ideas with these people. I know this sounds well, no, but delusional, so, but you know. <laughs> no, just wondering, when, when, did you well, so, when, did you, when did you upgrade from imaginary friends to real friends, I suppose, is what I'm thinking. <laughs> well, that was sort of early childhood, but I think once I started going to medical school and interacting with people, then, then, then you know, some people say I'm still socially awkward, but <laughs> maybe not. Um, th then, I, then I started interacting with people. I think that shyness went away, and I, you know, I don't know about giving lectures, and I think that that's trick you learn watching other people to some extent. And, and maybe there's components of it that's really part of your innate personality. But um, going back to, sorry, there's another question embedded there which I'm missing. So sorry, you're talking about moving from social awkwardness. Well, there was the, the bedside manner and the showman. How did, yeah, how did, how did those emerge from? I mean, from you know, if, if you look at, again, going back to the 19th century, if you look at all these people, whether Huxley or mm. Barrett and all these people, if you'll pardon the sort of lofty comparison. But if you go to these people, they were doing nitty-gritty experiments most of the time. But when called upon to do so, I think the most important thing about being a communicator, again, it harks back to what I said about being passionate and excited. Somebody's talking about Kashmiri shawls. How did it excite my interest? You know, it's about you being, if you're not excited about something, you can't communicate it to somebody else, right? So you have to be, first of all, your story has to be clear, right? That's one thing. And secondly, you know, you have to be excited about it. These are the two minimum requirements, and, and then you're a good communicator. So how, how does America in, come into this? Because, I mean, you, you're, a lot of this is Victorian, it's English, it's you're a fellow of all souls, which is a quintessential Oxford College, yeah. Royal Institution. When did you come to the States, or did you, when did your family come to the States? Well, I mean, I, I came to the States just for in search of good fortune, and, and uh, at that time there were not that many jobs in England, and I got offered this position, so I came here. But um, to, to brief answer to your question is I really enjoy, enjoyed Victorian science, reading about it, because it's the dawn, the beginning of science. And science is most exciting in the very beginning when people are still tinkering and playing around and saying, what if I do this? What if I move this magnet in this coil? What if I sprinkle iron filings on a sheet of paper? What if I put my wife's hand in front of the cathode ray tube? It is not motivated by some deep insight but, but you're just essentially going, going on fishing expeditions. But you have to have intuition. Ob obviously, there's always a serious agenda underlying the playfulness and, and uh, going after anomalies and that sort of thing. And science was a lot of fun. To put it differently, it was a lot of fun and, uh, during Victorian times. And it was a grand, it was fun at the same time, it was a grand romantic enterprise. And some of that is dying. And, and fortunately, still not completely dead in England. But in the United States, I strongly believe, and of course, there are lots of exceptions, people who have this romantic vision, who are idealistic, who are still excited. But I think very often it becomes a nine to five job. You know, you go in there and do something. And I think it's partly the educational system, and partly it becomes a production line thing, an assembly line thing, you know. And I think the, the, the antidote to that is to read a lot about the history of science and hang around people who are excited about science, who are constantly passionate, who are enthusiastic, Hanging around, uh, you know, Francis Crick, hanging around Terry Sanofsky, hanging around, you know, people, Roger Bingham, you know, people who are excited about what they're doing. And I think that's a good recipe, you know, uh, to, to becoming excited about it yourself and um, uh, not transforming it into a boring nine to five job. If you couldn't have been a scientist, what would you have liked to have been? I, I would have been an archaeologist, I think, uh, mm. and or a paleontologist, because it has that same sense of, going and looking at odd things and, you know, like Schliemann looking at the Iliad and the Odyssey, the, uh, the Iliad, and saying, well, this is not a legend. There, there is Troy. So you're still saying in science, staying in science, basically. I mean, it's not well, yeah, if you want to call archaeology a science, that's true. No great passion to be a, a, a concert conductor or something? Uh, no, but maybe a, a vocal musician or maybe a, a poet, you know, writing poetry, but I enjoy reading poetry. 
uh, because <coughs> the great thing about poetry and literature, of course, is one of a kind. In other words, if Darwin had died prematurely, it would have been another 20 years before Wallace would have worked it all out, maybe 10 years. Right? Um, I don't want to say Rosalind Franklin, and let's not go there, Frank Watson, Crick and Watson, but most discoveries in science, if somebody doesn't make it, it's a matter of time, five years, 10 years. They don't have that unique, even though, as I, as I said, it is a romantic enterprise, there's as much creativity in science as in the arts. But the great thing about arts is that each piece, each poem, is unique. When Shakespeare says, tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow, creeps in this petty pace. Or when he says, when King Lear says, when we are born, we cry because we have come to this great stage of fools. That says it all, right, in my mind. I mean, <laughs> okay. And that line is enough to justify Shakespeare's entire life. Forget about all his other plays, right? All the passage in Macbeth about tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's the great thing about the arts and about poetry and all of that. So to be able to do something like that must be a wonderful experience. In science, you, you do experience joy creating something, but you say, if I haven't done it, 10 years from now, somebody else would have done it. So what, what discovery would you have liked to have made? In science? Mm. Well, uh, that's a very good question. Um, many times you curse yourself and you say, why didn't I think of it? So that's one class of Oh, T.H. Huxley discovery. did that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, but sometimes you say, I did think of it, but I didn't do anything about it. And that's when you really kick yourself. You know. When I was in, in Cambridge, and I was mainly doing physiology and medicine, things like that, and I said, I read somewhere, and this is common knowledge among students, medical students, if an asthmatic person smells a rose, of course he starts wheezing, the pollen gets in, he may die, right? Now here's the interesting observation. If an asthmatic sees a plastic rose, he can immediately, his lungs go into spasm. You know, the mast cells release histamine, and serotonin, histamine, all of that. Histamine, I think. And, you, and, you, and the uh, bronchioles go into spasm, you get an asthmatic. And people said, it's conditioning. Okay? And remember, this is long before immune conditioning was discovered. Hmm. And I said, my God, if you can do this, why can't you play a loud sound to a rat, give it steroids to su suppress its immune system, right? Would you then just present the sound and the rat immediately suppresses his immune system. Or why not give this asthmatic antihistamines every time you play a note, right? So he just carries this thing which produces a note in his pocket. <laughs> and as soon as he sees a flower and says wheezing, he just rings the note and he stops wheezing. <laughs> and I, I said this to my physiology professor, David Whitridge, and he said, he laughed and he said, oh, it's a joke. You know? <laughs> but guess what? If I had pursued it, I would have given, I would have been much more famous than I am now. I would have given birth to the whole discipline of psychoneuroimmunology mm -hmm. if I had just pursued that. Because somebody did that very same experiment 10, 15 years later and found you can actually do conditioning of the immune system. And now there's a whole area of research. And it's very important for things like, you know, people used to think it's all flaky mind body interaction and mind body medicine. Now it's all legitimate because of that discovery. This is in the same vein as when you were a child. Did, did you not sort of try and see if you could persuade what happened with ants if you Oh, yeah. There are a number of uh, little or... experiments, and I still don't know the answer to this. Maybe, maybe you know the answer. And that is, you know, I was looking at ants going for sugar, uh, you know, all the time. Everybody knows this. But the question is, can you put saccharin? And would the ants go for that? And, you know, would the receptors be fooled? It was my first psychophysical experiment. Would the receptors be fooled by saccharin just as your receptors are? Does the ant despite 600 million years of evolutionary gap, mm. has the same sweet receptors as you and I do? I don't know the answer. The other, other experiment I tried, again, I couldn't get it to work, was we know that tadpoles, if you cut their tail, they regenerate. If you cut an arm, it regenerates. A human being, cut the arm, it doesn't regenerate. If you could learn the trick, maybe humans will regenerate arms, right? What could be more important? A frog, after metamorphosis, if you cut the arm, does not regenerate. Now, is that because it's a frog or is it because it's older? How do you find out? So I put thiouracil in the water. This blocks metamorphosis. So you get a geriatric tadpole, very old, big tadpole of arms. And the question is, if you cut the arm off, 
does it regenerate? The tadpoles just died. I mean, I wasn't a good enough surgeon, right? So I don't know the answer. Maybe somebody knows, but, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a good question, right? I mean, is it aging that stops the, or is it the metamorphosis that stops the ability to regenerate? Yeah, anyway, I was fooling around with lots of little experiments of that nature. Who would you have, um, uh, who would you have liked to have had a conversation with? I mean, the, it can be alive, dead, it, mostly. I'm, I'm alive thinking, or dead. Well, I'm thinking they're probably dead because I said who would you would have liked yeah. to have had a conversation with? So. Well, uh, I think two or three people, probably Thomas Huxley, because he was a fascinating guy. I mean, most people would say Darwin because obviously <coughs> he was a genius and all that. But Huxley was not only a genius, but he was also fascinating. Um, he was interested in all kinds of things. He was a great expositor. And he had a personality that I can relate to. He was very, he had a lot of pugnacity. And I'm, I'm not me, but I'm saying I like people like that. They're always fun to watch, watch mm, them perform. Mm. And it's always fun to talk to them. So Huxley would be one. Wallace would be another, given the experiences that he had, traveling to Malaysia, traveling to, uh, so the great explorers. I like to talk to the great explorers, especially when there's also science mixed in, as was true of Wallace. So Huxley, Wallace, of course, Michael Faraday, what makes him tick, what makes him creative. But yeah, those, are, those would be the people I want to talk to. I neglected to ask you one thing during the consciousness when we were talking about consciousness, which is, do you believe in, do you, have, do you think we have free will? Do you think you have free will? Well, you know, it's funny you should ask that. I, I think, you, well, you should ask Pat Churchland, who you're going to be talking to soon. Um, the answer is that, okay, the, the question is there, is, there is determinism, you know. How do you know? Okay, I saw that and I did that. Okay, I'm not supposed to do that, but <laughs> I saw that and I did that, right? Now, I have this distinct sense of picking it up. And if you give me two, an apple and a banana, okay, I'll do that. And I knew I did it. So there are many components to it. I conjured up an internal vision of possibilities, that I can do this and I can do that, the sense of agency. And by the way, I, can, I think specific brain structures are involved. The inferior parietal lobule, again, the supramarginal gyrus, is involved in enabling you to conjure up possibilities of movements. right? And that's undoubtedly a component of free will. I can do this, I can do that, possibilities. right? The anterior cingulate is involved. We know that when it's damaged, people say, they're fully conscious, but I didn't want to do anything. So when they come out of this, right? They say, "Oh, I knew what was going on. I just, I don't want to do anything about it. I don't. I knew I could hear you talking. I just didn't want to reply, right? They just completely spaced out, like you know, like potheads. Same sort of complete lack of any, total in, lack of initiative and ambition. I'm not not, not to debunk, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right? So, what was this? Oh, free will. Okay. <laughs> I do like an old argument, by the way, which is put forward by Don Mackay. Nobody else likes this argument, but I think it makes sense. It's a sort of a Gödelian argument, which says that let's assume that my brain, for the sake of argument, well, first of all, it's not a deterministic machine because, you know, chaos theory and randomness and maybe even quantum mechanical effects spreading into the brain a la Penrose, even though I don't believe that. But let's assume it's like a billiard ball table. You know, I see this, comes in, light quanta, eyes, da 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 da, -da goes through the brain, my hand reaches out like that, right? And even if I'm thinking about it and making a choice, a super scientist looking from above, watching my brain, could have predicted that. Exactly. Even though I think it's my will doing it, he could have predicted that. Let's assume that's true. That's the worst case, right, for free will. So I say, OK, you're the super scientist. I believe in free will. Look at my, what's going on in my brain until the very last minute, last second, in fact. Write it down on a piece of paper. And then I'll make my choice and see if your prediction is correct. Right? And the answer is, it's always correct. Because you're a deterministic scientist. My brain is a deterministic system. And just before I make the choice, you've seen all the cascade of chemicals. And you say, yeah, I just predicted it before you made it. Therefore, you have no free will. But here's the crux of the argument. Yeah. That prediction is only valid for you. Because the minute you show it to me, I can change my mind. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm a human being and I understand the meaning of what you've said. Again, the meaning is critical. Then I can change my mind and perversely say, I'll do the opposite. It's because the very act of listening to you is going to change the validity of the prediction. Right? The prediction is no longer true. Now, you could say, OK, I'll build that into the prediction. You can't, because it gets into an endless regress. Because if you build it into the prediction, you have to, you have yet again a new prediction. And again, if you tell me the new prediction, yet again it changes the prediction. Okay. 
you could take, I can have an auto cerebroscope looking at my own brain events right up to the last minute, and I'm watching it. And I say, oh, I'm going to touch this. And he said, oh, no, I'm going to change my mind. I'll touch this. In other words, if you're a conscient, conscious agent capable of appreciating meaning, right, then if a determinist scientist gives you a complete prediction, valid up to the last minute, that prediction is valid in some ontological sense only to that external agent. The minute it's internalized, that prediction is no longer valid. It's not that I The point I'm making is that I simply cannot make a prediction about my next future state. I can will it, but I cannot make a prediction. This is Makai's argument. It's the only argument about free will in some real sense that makes any sense to me, if you're a conscious human being. Every other argument I've seen supports deterministic view. What or about if you say there's <clears throat> randomness, it doesn't mean it's free will. It just means quixotic. <laughs> it means your behavior can be slightly flexible. It doesn't mean it's free will. What about the, 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 the stories that emerged from Ben Libet's experiment? Well, I think as, as, as Churchill and others have pointed out, and Dan Dennett, it, it is Dan Dennett and Churchill and uh, eminent philosophers who have talked about this a great deal, um, it's these temporal paradoxes. You know, briefly, the Libet experiment is you record brain waves from the skull, the activity of the brain, when you're making movements. And it turns out you ask a person, I'm going to measure these brain waves. There's a thing called the readiness potential a wave that occurs before you move your hand. Okay, So you ask this chap, in the next five minutes, I'm simplifying the experiment, but tell him in the next five minutes, move your hand any time you want, a couple of times. And the chap just waits, and after 10 seconds or 30 seconds or one minute, he moves his hand. The astonishing thing is, you pick up the readiness potential almost half a second or more prior to his moving his hand. right? prior to his internal sensation of having initiated the command. You know that because you can have a rapidly moving dial on the clock, and you ask him when he initiated the command. And he says, yes, or whatever. And he, says, he remembers the time when he initiated the command. And you find that your brain activity has been recorded 30 seconds earlier. So if his will came in 30 seconds later, how can the will, quote unquote, have been responsible for the hand movement. It must be an illusion because it's a post hoc delusion or rationalization because the brain event was picked up prior to your sensation of will. It's not time locked. right? But these temporal paradoxes of will can occur for all sorts of reasons. It's not any more mysterious. It's because the event timing of events of the brain and what you pick up versus your motor command, there's no reason they should be precisely time locked. There's a smearing of space time when you move an event. There's no reason that the subjective sensation should precisely coincide with your internal sensation. So that's where I think there is a, a flaw in his logic. But it raises an interesting question, and we have tried to set this up, and we may indeed set it up with, um, in collaboration with, uh, with, uh, uh, with people at the SALT, uh, blocking his name. Um, so what, what we're going to do is to take this readiness signal and in real time display it to the person. So you tell them, anytime you feel like it, wiggle your finger. Now, the trouble is, you can display that signal to him 0.5 seconds before he wills it. Now, what the hell is he going to say? He's going to see the thing on the screen, and then his hand does that. Is he going to say, there are only three possibilities. The machine has ESP. It's predicting what I'm going to do. I don't have free will. OK? My god, <laughs> you know, I'm locked to the machine, right? <laughs> Or he's going to post-date the events. He's going to say, what do you mean it, it, it happened before? Uh -huh. It happened after I sent the will in. So all three possibilities can happen. It would be very, very interesting empirically <coughs> to see what happens. And it would be wonderful if, wonderful if I convinced people that they don't have free will. <laughs> Machine is controlling everything. It's just a puppet in a deterministic world. How would that affect your worldview? One last thing. How does this, um, all of this that we've talked about, map onto your your background? I mean, you talked about the veil of Maya, the whole notion of illusion. Come from a country that was Advaita Vedanta, the notion of. Um, well, a couple of things. Given my background, I'll get to the mysticism bit in a minute. <laughs> but just in terms of style of doing research, my training in medicine I think helps a lot, because what happens? You may say medicine is completely unrelated to 
doing research on psychophysics or, well, it's related to neurology, obviously, but what <coughs> I do is nothing like routine clinical neurology. So how did I get here, and how is it useful? One answer is it's useful because you're forced to, especially when I was trained, my initial training was in India, you see patients, you don't, you, at that time you didn't have any imaging technology. In fact, you couldn't even get a blood panel very quickly, right? So you're forced to use clinical acumen, clinical ingenuity. And you really have to be like Sherlock Holmes. You have to just use a few signs to figure out what's going on in the, in the patient. And if you didn't do it quickly enough, he'd be dead or very sick, right? For example, my favorite example is appendicitis, right? And these days, you diagnose it very quickly. But in the old days, a guy just comes with lower right quadrant, severe pain, vomiting, <coughs> fever. Already you know, <coughs> maybe it's appendicitis. And if it is, you have to remove it. <coughs> because if it bursts, spills its contents, you get peritonitis and you die. So you have to remove it. But how do you know he's got appendicitis? A number of things can produce that, those symptoms, <coughs> right? You ask him, tell me about the pain. He says the pain started in the, <coughs> in the umbilicus, in the belly button. And then, it, funny doctor, it moved to my lower right quadrant. That only happens with appendicitis. And the reason is in the embryo, <coughs> the appendix was right here in the, under the belly button, right? And then as you grow up and the intestines get thrown into falls, it gets pushed to the right lower side. And your brain doesn't know that. It still thinks that the appendix is sitting here under your belly button. So you mislocalize it there. And then when the appendix becomes completely inflamed, it ir irritates the abdominal wall, right? And then, of course, you correctly localize it and you say it's here. But this migrating pain, mm -hmm. <coughs> and then you do another thing. You just press him on the left side. You press him on the right side, of course, it's painful because you're compressing the appendix. But you press him on the left side, and it's ouch, and it hurts him on the right side. The reason it turns out, again, it's paradoxical, right? You're displacing the gas in the, in the colon, along the transverse colon, and then expanding this inflamed appendix, so, chow, so it pains here. Now, you see those two things immediately schedule surgery. So this shows, without any equipment, if you know the right thing to do, you can diagnose very quickly. Now, that's sitting in your brain that it's all about simplicity of experiments and knowing what to look for rather than high tech and um, deep insight and all of those things. That comes later. <coughs> OK, that's number one. Now, going back to mysticism. So you asked about my background. Secondly, going to mysticism. All of Indian philosophy is all about consciousness. Is that a soul? Is that a mind? What is mind? What is soul? Who are you? How did you come to be? You're obsessed with this. So were the Greeks, by the way. Right? Now, <coughs> you can't see a patient in neurology without confronting these very questions. What do you mean by self? How come this guy is saying, I'm dead? Disorder called Cotard syndrome. Right? I'm not alive. I'm dead. He's not crazy because he'll play chess with you. And everything else is fine, but he says, he says he's dead. And he's absolutely convinced he's dead. In fact, you can take a needle and say, are you sure you're dead? He says, yes. Do dead men bleed? He says, of course not. No. Poke. And he starts bleeding. Well, I guess dead men do bleed after all. <laughs> okay? So that conviction stays in your brain. Why do, how did that happen? The self often is inconsistent. You say, this is my arm. No, sorry. I, sh I show you your arm. You've got a right parietal lesion. Doctor, that's my mother's arm. If it's your mother's arm, how is, how, why, why is it attached to you? He just stares at you. He won't answer that question. Or he'll confabulate. He'll say, I don't know. My arm is behind me somewhere. <laughs> okay. He'll make up a story. Now, people think this is something very spooky and strange, denial. But in fact, it's very common. right? Maybe I've told you this before, but we do it all the time in our daily lives. For example, to give you a frivolous example, if you ask people what is their IQ, 98% is it above average, below average? 98% of people say it's above average. In fact, they'll say it's well above average. Now, this is mathematically impossible because it's a Gaussian distribution. In fact, half the people are below average. Scary thought. <laughs> half the people in this world are below average in intelligence, but they're in denial about it. Okay, they refuse to accept it. This is painfully evident in our recent presidential election, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so denial happens all the time in our lives. So what I'm saying is, when you are raised in India, you're confronted with questions about the mind all the time, but all of it is quite mystical. And some of that must have spilled over into my thinking about neurology 
and consciousness and mind. My interest in it, my approach, of course, is completely empirical and scientific and hard-nosed. But speaking of that, there is one question, I think, which is really metaphysics and not science and reality. And that is the question of, there is an objective world, the thousands of millions of people, right? But I have this sense that I am me and I'm special. I'm inspecting the world from this point. This little, tiny little flicker of light in the whole space-time manifold. Einstein was puzzled by this. He said the notion of here, now, me is not there in physics. It just doesn't exist. right? And that's a problem in metaphysics. And of course, it's intimately linked to the self sense of self, the idea about souls, things like that. No less a person than Kurt Gödel, the greatest, arguably the greatest logician of the century, was puzzled by this problem. He said, who is me, who is here, who am I, and what is now? Is not there in anywhere in the space-time manifold, this little spot. So that, you know, nothing to do with brain consciousness and all that, but Schrodinger wrote a book. Half the book deals with this problem. So I think there's something important there which most scientists, physicists, don't know about and don't care about. What would your advice be to a young scientist? I'm just remembering Sir Peter Medawar's book. Yeah, well, I would say that a couple of things. I mean, there's no recipe, obviously. It depends on your personality, right? But several things. Uh, one thing is hang around people who are exciting and passionate about what they do, because it's very contagious. Avoid, like, the plague pedants and, and people who are just doing engaged in drudgery, you know. Hang around creative people, enthusiastic people, and because passion is contagious, as I say. Read a lot about the history of science. There's a misconception that people, when they retire, and are old fuddy daddies, and they start reading about history. Some truth to that. But I think young scientists, people are getting into the field, you read history about how discoveries were made, it has two functions. One function is you emulate the style of those scientists you're reading about. And it's not surprising that most Nobel Prizes are won by people who are students. Disproportionate number of Nobel Prizes are won by students or grand students of a Nobel laureate. Now, the cynical view of this is an old boy network. Okay? <coughs> I don't buy that. Okay? I think that it's because you emulate the style of the, of, the, of the people. So hanging around people who are enthusiastic or quote unquote great scientists or uh, reading about the discoveries and how they were made serves the purpose of you emulate their style, A. B, another reason for doing it is it makes science more fun because it puts your enterprise in, a, in context. It's not me in a, trapped in this narrow cul-de-sac doing all these measurements, which you need to do, obviously. But you have to avoid the cul-de-sac phenomenon, which is very pernicious and very common in modern science. You feel comfortable in this little cul-de-sac. You get rewarded because you send this paper off and the, and the reviewer in your own little field says, oh, it's a great paper, and it gets published in your own specialized journal. And you say, oh, oh and is this human nature, right? You have this club, and other people in the club think you're great. And you engage in this mutual admiration and backslapping. And that's the death of science. If you want to do science, get out of the cul-de-sac. Of course, you have to periodically re-enter, make careful measurements, be worried about what your colleagues are thinking. But What's much more important is to get out of the cul-de-sac, look at the whole history of science, look at what you're doing, give you, you know, giving it a sense of perspective. Right? So these are the two things I would say. Read widely, things completely unrelated, seemingly unrelated to your work. You know, that's A, because novel insights come from interdisciplinary, uh, cross-fertilization of ideas. Whether it's DNA, you know, Craig jumping into X-ray crystallography, I can think of a dozens of examples, hundreds of such examples. Read widely, hang around people who are passionate, enthusiastic, and very good at what they're doing. Jump outside your cul-de-sac and, and re read a lot about history of science. And uh, the next generation is coming along, I gather. I was reading in the San Diego newspaper recently that your son, um, apparently in typical Rama fashion, got an absolutely perfect score on his SATs. He did indeed. And by reading them for a couple of weeks before he had to take the exam. Oh. So yeah, it, yeah, well, thank you for raising that. I mean, he, he is a very bright kid, but he was very erratic about two or three years ago. He's now 16. And he would get outstanding grades in some classes and poor grades in other classes. Uh, 
But I knew he was smart because he had a great sense of humor. You know, my wife is American and that's she enjoys a, camping. That's a great mother too. <laughs> yeah. And she enjoys camping a lot. So she said, let's all go camping. And money's not very outdoors. And he said, um, mom, the reason mankind invented houses was to avoid camping. <laughs> this coming from a 13 year old, I thought was pretty smart. You know, So he's pretty creative, I always knew that. But neurotic and sometimes sometimes um, moody. People said, no, don't worry, that's just typical teenage stuff. You know, He still does that, but he's very smart, writes poetry, imaginative, and all of that. Sounds like but, it. But you know, by the way, on that note, my younger boy, his son, brings his homework, insists I do it all the time. <laughs> so he, he brings us books on science, and I said, OK, I'll help you with the homework. It's the most incredibly boring textbooks you can find. It's nothing like the textbooks I used to read as a child. You know, I'm really trying to make a political statement here. I look through these books, <clears throat> and it's all about how you recycle fuel and oil, and this is nothing, nothing, very little about basic science, nothing about Faraday, nothing about sprinkling, <laughs> you know, nothing about radioactivity, all the exciting. I'm not saying only basic science is exciting, but it's all about, you know, the weather and the climate, and then, you know, recycling waste. There are about three chapters on recycling waste, you know. And I read it, and I said, how can this kid, and my, my second kid is smarter, no wonder he finds it absolutely boring. And then I discovered, I read an article by Feynman on precisely this question. He was appointed to a board to judge which textbook should be used nationwide, which is in itself peculiar. Why should they have one textbook for the entire country? I mean, it's bizarre, right? And he sat on this board, and it's all about publishers coming to him, whining and dining him, phoning him, telling him even that they would arrange a call girl for him. Can you believe this? This is there in writing in his, in his book, right? Saying, adopt our textbook. It's a great textbook. And he realized this is not because he was Feynman. They were doing it to all the board members. And he says, this is highly unethical. It's the sort of thing drug reps, reps do to physicians all the time. And it still continues, right? And then there's this tendency to homogenize the textbook, make it completely boring, and, and what drives it is the book publishing industry. And this is most unfortunate and needs to be corrected. You're obviously not feeling very passionate about this at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure many would agree with this. Um, so I, I think that what we have here is an N of one in Ramachandran. Um, do, you, do, you, do you wish you had uh, a whole generation of students like you, following you? Well, I mean, it's, it's up to them. I mean, I have a few students who, who sort of not only emulate my style, but my, my mannerisms. That's spooky. But, <laughs> uh, but, but the thing is, um, what I would say in response to that, every student has to develop his own originality and style. To some extent, yes, of course, you want people to follow up on your research and maybe even emulate aspects of your style. And I try to convey the, the enthusiasm and style of doing research to other students. It rubs off sometimes. Sometimes uh, somebody has a completely different style and does outstandingly well. So you know, it's important not to classify the person or try and make the person emulate you. you know. What's next for you? What's yeah. the next piece of research you're working on? Well, again, that's very hard to answer because the kind of research I do, it's often opportunistic. You know, here's some strange thing. Let me pursue it. Uh, but I'm very interested in higher functions in, in, in the human brain. We talked about what makes the human brain unique. I talked about culture. So we're interested in things like mirror neurons. And there's been a lot of physiological work. But what we want to do is design perceptual psychological experiments to test the functions of mirror neurons, and then look at neurological dysfunction in terms of what's happening to mirror neurons. So this leads you into higher functions. For example, how do we engage in abstraction? People think of intelligence as one thing, right? IQ tests, or at most two things, verbal IQ, spatial IQ. You know, this is ludicrous because you take the liver, wrong side, liver, OK? The liver has 30 functions each of which is quite distinct, right? And each of which can go wrong. There's bile secretion, there's glycogen storage, dozens of functions. Enzymes to portal blood flow, detoxifying portal blood, all kinds of things. Can it be that the brain is vastly more sophisticated, especially in humans, has one thing called IQ that you can measure? It's absolute hmm. idiocy, right? So there are lots and lots of functions, higher functions, which probably are unique to humans, like attaching meaning to things abstract symbol manipulation. How do we manipulate symbols in your head offline? Right? How do you do transitional logic? 
if A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, A must be bigger than C. Is that because through hundreds of instances of induction, you've developed deductive logic? Because every time you saw A bigger than B, B bigger than C, A turned out to be bigger than C. Probably not. Okay? Is there some other algorithm? And how is it instantiated in your brain? What parts of the brain are involved in this type of reasoning? So we're looking at Wernicke's aphasia, patients who don't have semantics of language. Do you need language, whether syntactic language or semantics or comprehension, to make transitional statements? A is bigger than B, B is bigger than C. Therefore, A is bigger than C. Obviously, you can't do it verbally. But there is this whole theory in psychology, Worfian hypothesis, that you need language to think. So here is a simple way of testing it. I mean, others have done this too, by the way. But the way we're tackling it is looking at people with very discrete brain lesions who have lost functions and see, can they do transitional logic? And the challenge there is, how do you do it without using words? You have to do it non-verbally, right? So this looks at, explores the interface between language on the one hand and thought on the other hand. So things like meaning, consciousness, language, thinking, all the big questions. By tackled by looking at people with damage to different parts of the circuit, especially the circuits I mentioned earlier, Wernicke's area, inferior parietal lobule. We've already found a region in the left side of the brain which seems to be involved in metaphor comprehension. You wouldn't have suspected this, but when that's damaged, left inferior parietal lobule, people have a great deal of difficulty in, in interpreting proverbs. They talk to you normally. They play chess with you. Their IQ is normal in most respects. Then you ask them, all that glitters is not gold. What does that mean? And the chap says, what would you say? You would say, don't be deceived by appearances. Mm -hmm. This chap says, oh, well, you know, just because it's shiny and, and, and glowing, it doesn't mean it's gold. It could be copper. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I know, but is that a deep meaning beyond that? Can you take it further? And he says, oh, yeah. I mean, it means if you go to a jewelry shop, you have to be very careful because the guys are out to rip you off. So what you have to do is you have to take the specific gravity, then you know it's really gold and not copper. So he's not stupid. He says, take the specific gravity and da-da-da-da-da. And this is typical. You can give him 10 proverbs, and he always latches onto the literal meaning. Now, when mm. we sent it to the journal for publication, <coughs> the referee said, oh, well, how do you know they're just not, not bright? You know, they, they can't talk, whatever. You know, they're stupid. They don't understand the question. Well, it's obvious, because when you give it to them, they clearly understand what you're asking, because they often give you elaborate, convoluted, even ingenious interpretations of the proverb, mm -hmm. but completely missing the point a bit like the people who review my grant proposals. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, uh, perhaps you can come back another time and tell us about the results of all these experiments. So um, sure, thank you so thank much, you very much, Ramachandran. Thanks a lot. Thank you.